Welcome to National Bourbon Heritage Month. According to Wikipedia, National Bourbon Heritage Month is an observance in the United States that calls for a celebration of bourbon as America's native spirit during the month of September. On August 2nd, 2007, the United States Senate declared September 2007 as National Bourbon Heritage Month. The bill sponsored by Republican Senator Jim Bunning of Kentucky passed by unanimous consent. The bill resolution calls for consumers who enjoy bourbon to do so responsibly and in moderation. The bill reinforces the 1964 concurrent resolution of Congress that recognized bourbon whiskey as a distinctive product of the United States. To celebrate America's native spirit and National Bourbon Heritage Month, the city of Bardstown, Kentucky has hosted the Kentucky Bourbon Festival every September since 1991. The festival is dedicated to celebrate the history and art of distilling bourbon whiskey. In 1783, Evan Williams opens the first commercial distillery in Kentucky. In 1886, bartenders amp up whiskey cocktail with new ingredients, leading to a purist movement advocating for the old-fashioned drink. In 2023, there were 31 million 9-liter cases of bourbon sold. So how do you celebrate Bourbon Heritage Month? Well, mix up a cocktail, host a bourbon tasting, or attend a virtual tasting, or visit a distillery and celebrate all that is bourbon. Bourbon must be made in the United States only. Bourbon must be aged in a charred new oak barrel. The result must consist of at least 51% corn, Whiskey cannot enter the barrel higher than 125 proof, and distilleries can add anything except water to lessen the proof when necessary. Remember, drink responsibly, celebrate bourbon, and its unique history in the United States. Cheers! Ladies and gentlemen, craft spirit enthusiasts, and those interested in the intoxicating world of craft distilleries, cideries, meaderies, wineries, and the occasional foray into breweries. It's Rich Sheen, and welcome to Fermented Adventure, the podcast, where we bring you the fascinating people that are making the mash, fermenting, distilling, bottling, pouring, and delivering to you some of the finest libations in the world. Before we get started, here are a few housekeeping items. Thank you for bringing the podcast into wherever you are and whatever you're doing. We truly are grateful that you've chosen to listen and make us part of your day. It would mean the world to us if you left a five-star review. This helps us climb in the rankings and it makes it easier for others to find us. Don't hesitate to leave us your comments as well. If the podcast didn't meet your expectations, tell us why. We're always striving to improve. You can find us at fermentedadventure.com. We are on Instagram and Facebook as Fermented Adventure. Email us at fermentedadventure at gmail.com. All right, FA Nation, let's meet our guest. He's Pat Martin. I'm Rich Shane. This is Fermented Adventure, the podcast. Pat, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Rich. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. We have been introduced by Bedfluence. They're a great group of people, and we've had them as a guest on the podcast. And I know if Bedfluence says, you need to talk to Milk and Honey Ciders, we need to talk to Milk and Honey Ciders. We've had these wonderful expressions waiting for us, and I can't wait to talk about all that you do. How did Milk and Honey Ciders get started? So I've been with the cidery three years and it's a group of three guys that um have some unique backgrounds uh they i think childhood friends for the three of them Um, there's peter there's aaron and there's adam um adam went to brewery school so he's pretty uh pretty familiar with his uh yeasts and his his grains and such um aaron has a background in uh flight school so some logistical things there and then peter had um he worked for the minnesota department of agriculture for a number of years so some of their interests and uh came together and they decided to form the cidery um and we specialize more in heirloom and heritage apple varieties um of apples and try to make semi-dry to dry aromatic and interesting ciders um 
yeah, that's the short of it is that these three guys had a had an interest in making some really good cider, and it's taken off pretty well for them. Now you're coming to us from Minnesota. Speak to the growing season. Speak to the varietals. Speak to. In my head, I'm always thinking it's going to be colder, and I'm not sure what what varietals that are going to come out of Minnesota. Right. Um, so yeah, the growing season. It's uh, we have a hard frost really from like late November to um, whenever it thaws, generally in late March, early April. Um, it lends itself well. We do make an ice cider. I don't remember, uh, Rich, which uh, expressions you received from us, um, but we we do make an ice cider, which the Minnesota climate lends itself well to that. Um, but yeah, again, the apple varieties that we're looking for are a lot of bittersweets looking for some tannic varieties um what do we have we have i mean some that uh some of the apple varieties are probably pretty familiar and uh across the country and across the world like we use kingston black we have some kingston black apples um we have a, a acre of chisel jersey in our orchards um some red fields uh we also work with the minnesota department of agriculture to they have a you know apple cultivation program to develop different apple varieties and we have an acre of an apple variety that is in the ground that's intended as a uh, as a minnesota cider apple uh, there's we're playing around with the idea of calling it a minnesota russet if it you know graduates to the naming stage of uh you know getting that nice prestigious mark as an apple varietal um but yeah, we're fond of golden russet. We make a golden russet single varietal cider. So um, yeah, those are some of the varietals that are that we have floating around at the cidery and um, ones that are kind of prominent in, in what we're making. Pardon the interruption. Thank you so much for listening to Fermented Adventure, the podcast. Could you do us a favor? Hit that follow button. It makes it easier for others to find us and it helps us climb in the rankings. Take a screenshot of the podcast, post it, tag us, and let everyone know that you listen to the Fermented Adventure podcast. Now, back to our podcast. What you touched on about working with the Department of Agriculture and creating this varietal, I think for cider drinkers, that's exciting. It is, if you have not listened to the podcast before, but it's akin to these vineyards and either bringing a great varietal in that they haven't grown or trying to maybe do a little bit of a hybrid but something that i think for you and minnesota that is going to be more climate friendly or more um growth friendly you mentioned ice sayers mm -hmm. and you know i have you know we've had conversations with the eden ciders and some of these ice ciders are becoming a little bit more difficult to grow. It mm -hmm. sounds to me like you're able to still really make that a purposeful cider and you're mm -hmm. not or have not yet been affected. And it's still something you're able to do. This last winter was really mild. So we had, uh, you know, it was there was a warm enough week in early January that 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 did disrupt some of what we were up to. Um, with the ice cider. Um, but yeah, I think up until that point, as long as uh, those guys had been making ice cider, it had not been an issue with um, with the climate that we have. Um, and yeah, I'm hoping that this year it will again be cold enough that that's not an issue. But yeah, we did have some, we've had some, you know, had to deal with some of the effects of, you know, the climate change that is, uh, you know, we had a warm winter that makes it hard to do ice cider, but it, it, uh, it's still possible to make a good product. And, um, yeah, I don't know if that's entirely responding to your, you know, your, no, comment. it is, it yeah. is. And, and I think, you know, the more people have an awareness of how the climate is a changing what you're able to grow and B change what you can bring in and grow. I think there's mm -hmm. certainly a higher level of appreciation for how hard everybody works at Milk and Honey Ciders to continue to have that consistent quality year in and year out. If like like for Dawn and I, 
if we're fans of ice ciders and they're harder and harder to find, you almost really have a better understanding of why and the ne necessity of taking care of what you have and, and trying to maintain that, all right, these are, this is what our customers want. How do we keep doing it? And uh, mm -hmm. it's some, sometimes it becomes challenging. I mean, you talk about Adam and he has a, a brewer's background. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you certainly talk about Peter and being department of the Minnesota department of agriculture. I'm not sure where Aaron and being a pilot or being in flight kind of works his way in there yeah. unless he's crop dusting. I don't know, but it sounds so, like these are three good friends and they've all yeah, come together for their passion of cider making. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Aaron, uh, Aaron's, I work directly with Aaron cause I do most of the wholesales and, um, we send, you know, we're about an hour and a half, depending on where you're at an hour to an hour and a half away from much of our market in Minneapolis and St. Paul. And so we send a van down two one or two times a week, you know, full of the cases of cider. And so he's always looking at like the weight and how much is this going to affect like the chassis of the vehicle. And, um, but if I'm taking an order, he's like, okay, don't take too many kegs down because you're going to like, you know, we don't want to be rough on your car. So some of that I think has, you know, some, some of his background in um, working in the airline industry, I think has played into what he can do. And also like the different mechanical elements that are incorporated in like making and producing cider, I think have been useful for, for him as a, uh, you know, in that, in this passion or in the, you know, that career change for, for him. But um, yeah, as far as going back a little bit to what you're saying about um, where we get our apples or how we're getting our apples. I mean, we do, we have eight acres of our own orchards, but um, we are sourcing apples from a lot of different places. Um, and that's part of, that's just part of the nature of our size and like the kind of cider that we're aiming to produce. It's, uh, finding the bittersweets that fit the flavor profiles we're looking for. We're getting um, apples from New Hampshire, and Wisconsin, uh, Oregon, Washington, Idaho. So uh, other places within Minnesota, I believe. So there's, there's different orchards that are getting, cultivating the apples that we're looking for too. Milk and honey ciders. I love the name. How did that come about? I wish I knew exactly where it came about, but I, um, I have the impression that, you know, milk and honey, the land of milk and honey is actually a little bit biblical old Testament idea of like of Zion being the land flowing in milk and honey, which is the idea that a place is of abundant in goodness. Um, so, uh, I don't think that there's any particular like biblical stance that we're taking. It's more that idea and the concept of a place that's abundant in goodness is where that, that name comes from and what we're borrowing when we're uh, when we're using that as the name of the company. For you, Pat, how were you introduced to Cider and some of your recollections um, with what you're doing now as far as, you know, coming on board and trying some of these varietals and the experience you're having. Sure. Um, so I went to college at St. John's, which is five miles away from Milk and Honey. And so Milk and Honey was kind of a place that was the hangout spot for, for me when I was in grad school with friends. Um, my So uh, my wife and I, we were dating at the time that I was in grad school, but when we were looking for a wedding venue, um, we, we knew we, we have a connection to that area. And so we got married in a church that's in St. Joseph and then had our wedding reception out at the cidery. Um, and that actually kind of just snowballed for me that I was more interested in going to uh, the cidery. So I, I guess I should say I started working part time at the cidery in the tap room, you know, pouring the taps and talking to customers and, um, yeah, just generally working and cleaning the tap room. And I knew it was kind of starting to show a, a sign of like a good career change when I was getting more eager on a day where I would go to the office and then go work in the tap room. That mopping the floors at the cider was becoming more interesting than what my my day-to-day -day job was. Uh, the wholesale position opened up and uh, I was fortunate enough to you know get hired full-time full with the cidery. Um, but yeah, since I've been full-time, I've learned a lot about 
um, the different processes for making cider, um, the various apple varietals. Um, I'm not quite as well steeped in the apple varietal uh, world, but the, um, yeah, just the nature of being in and uh, contributing to a small business has all been part of that learning process of being full-time at the cidery. So, um, yeah, I'm passionate about cider. I enjoy, I'm, I think I I drink more cider now than what I did when I started. I remember when they, when I first went there, I was like, I'm not sure if I like any of these. I'm going to go with the beer that you have there. Cause I was a beer drinker before I was a cider drinker, but I think I, I didn't realize that I was spoiled rotten at first with how high quality the ciders are at milk and honey. Um, until later when I, gotten into the cider industry and folks around Minnesota are like, Oh yeah, you guys have really excellent products. So, uh, so that's a little bit about my introduction to milk and honey and cider in general. Like my it, milk and honey is kind of a watershed for me. Everything that beforehand was going into milk and honey and all my knowledge is kind of, of cider is kind of coming out from uh, being involved in milk and honey. So. Your origin story is fascinating. And I think it's a balance of what the cider industry still sees today, as you talked about working in the tap room. And I'm sure people like you, Pat, are still coming into the tap room and saying, eh, you know, I'm not a big cider drinker. Um, I'm more of a beer person or something mm -hmm. else. And it's that hesitation, perhaps, mm -hmm. and maybe for you, the same experience where you've had these sweet you know, overly sugarized ciders. And it's just been, all right, I had two or three of those. And then I woke up with a headache and um, I, I'm never doing cider again because that whatever that is in that bottle isn't for me. Mm. And you have a part of taking your origin story and saying, you know, I felt the same way, you know, and mm. look at me now. I'm working here at Milk and Honey Ciders. Do you find even in the Minnesota area where people have this appreciation for what you do, do you still find those conversations happening? But you're on the other side now. Yeah. Minnesota has, like, there is a long history with, like, the U of M and, like, the Honeycrisp Apple, for example. The, the Honeycrisp Apple was developed predominantly in southeast Minnesota. And I think that there is still this... Uh, delay maybe or like an education is required for a lot of like my friends or consumers that I talk to about like what cider is and some of the uh or like what cider can be I guess I should say with with like um the aromatic dry semi-dried compared to like the the sugar fruit bombs that you're you were kind of describing um some folks will just say like, oh, I don't want anything to do with that. That's way too sweet. You know, and when I'm doing like a tasting at a liquor store and it's like, well, this one won't be, I don't think. I mean, everyone's palate's different and like respecting the subjectivity of that is important. But um, I, I do find that like there's, there is this necessity to have this education that, yeah, I, I have that, I have a similar experience, like with how you kind of outlined it, it helps to like, be able to relate to to folks and kind of share that and share like a story of cider that's different from the what I think many people experienced at you know in their early twenties with um, you know I, I with my experience was uh, drinking Fireball and Angry Orchard together you know <laughs> and it was it was fun but it was uh, yeah one one or two of those was more than enough so yeah. You pay homage to a cocktail at the bar at the tap room for your 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 angry orchard uh, fireball experience. I I haven't. Um, we make a pomo or like a you know a mistel, a fruited apple brandy, and it's uh, yeah. There's sometimes there it's like oh yeah I could see how like if we use that that's really nice like that's a more mature version of a fireball and we could do something interesting and make a cocktail but no we haven't I, not that not that I can think of at the tap room there has there been a uh, a specific cocktail that's paid homage to the the orchard fire or the yeah anyway you touched upon the Honeycrisp apple and yeah. the fact that Minnesota was the birth of the Honeycrisp. And I think for Apple, you know, people that are consuming apples, 
the idea that there's a difference, especially with your orchards, there's a difference between eating apples and cider apples. And mm. the perception is so varied. And then you take in Adam's experience, as you pointed out, with yeast and how that can construct different flavor profiles in your cider. Mm. Do you find that, you know, somebody will say, I don't even like apples. So why would I like cider? And then the conversation is, it's like saying, I, I don't like grapes, but I drink wine, right? Yeah, yeah. That's a, yeah, that's a good point. I haven't really, that's a, that's an interesting point. I haven't encountered a whole lot of folks who are like, I, I like apples, but I don't drink cider. Um, and I guess like the coming that the other perspective from wine, I'm, I haven't encountered that as much as well either, but anyway. I, I say that only because I think that the level of cider is more to me compared to the level of wine. And the yeah. more I think cider producers look at it and say, all right, this is on that same scale. The way you drink it, the way you nose it, the way you, you know, appreciate it mm. is all along the same vein. Yeah, it's cider. And I think that um, cider producers are more fun people, not to, you know, not to disparage the wine people, but I think there's this, this mystique. You're still working hard, I think you're playing hard and you're out there having a good time. I'm staring at two bottles, um, one which is your milk and honey cider heirloom and one nice. which is your alchemy. By Great. the way, I love the branding. I love the labeling. Cool. Thank you. Who yeah. does that? I mean, who can we who can we shout out as to who does that? I actually don't know. I don't know their name. Uh, I think that I'm, that must be uh, kept well under wraps so that way nobody else can you know take that similar kind of art or style and mimic or copy it and so on. i i don't know i've asked about it and we have some marketing company that i i don't even know their name um, but i have asked about it a couple times with uh with aaron well, shout out to them the shout out to them for sure yeah they do a great job they it it's beautiful it it definitely like gives it gives a nice appearance i think people will look at the label and be like that's not the same as what I'm getting over with some other bigger, bigger brands. At least I don't think that, that I think that might be a perception, you know, just looking in a, a cooler door at the liquor store, you might be like, that one looks like that's going to be different than some others in here. Um, it's all, we only do bottles. Um, we don't do cans right now. So like that helps with um, potential for aging um, that, you know, in my work and also it's like, we're not going to, take it back because there's going to be an issue with it. And if there is an issue, then we're going to, of course, take it back and we'll figure that out. But like, you, you're not going to worry about your, um, like the quality of the product because it's in a bottle, it's safe, it's, you know, pasteurized, it's controlled, it's good. It's a good product and it will age fine. Um, it shouldn't change, you know, uh, except over the course of like maybe many years, but um, yeah, in that respect too, it's like wine and yeah, the heirloom's good. Um, I think we you know, we try to stick to the same uh, flavor profile in uh, in the heirloom from year to year, though sometimes the apple varietals will, will vary a little bit. So um, there are ten apple varieties on there. They're like on the label. That's you, you know from what you see. Uh, and there are and, ten apples on the label. Yeah, and if you look on the back, it it has like a an index for what you know what the image is to correspond to that apple varietal um i don't think that every single apple varietal that's on there is necessarily in every year's blend but um yeah because this year there's 14 apple varietals and i don't i'm not even certain which ones would be present which ones are absent from that label if that makes sense that does make sense. No, I mean, yeah. you, you've got this wonderful label. You've got the diagram. You've got the indication of, all right, go look in the back and see, you know, as a way to find out and get a better idea. What I see with this heirloom is you're telling a story about milk and honey ciders. You're mm -hmm. telling a story to say, hey, we are stewards of the land. We're stewards of the apple. And we're mm -hmm. going to bring all of these, you know, it's like, it's almost like that orchestra, right? You're you have different parts. You have the, the wind, woodwind, you have the strings, you have, and you're bringing them all together for harmony. So this is your orchestra. 
This is what uh, you're all putting together and saying this is an expression of bringing these apple varietals together to make this wonderful cider. I can tell you for me, on the nose, right away, there's some clean brightness to this. Um, it's very refreshing. It's it's actually very, it's got a very juicy nose. Mm -hmm. And almost the point where I get, I know this is more on the dry side. I expect it to be more on the dry side, but I almost get this like apple jam, um, this, this apple jelly on the nose. And it's a wonderful experience. And I, yeah. you know, I, what I do is I wait to try these. So um, yeah. after this, we'll, we'll share you. with other people. But now we get to have that experience. How do you, you know, when somebody comes and says, oh, Erlen, what's that about? How do you explain this or how do you yeah. um, talk Great. about it? Yeah, good question. Um, yeah, I, I'll usually, like once someone opens a bottle or like if I'm introducing it to, to someone, I'll say that it's, it's going to be fruity and crisp and sharp. Um, Get, I think you hit, hit it right on the head from what I normally do. It's a bright, you know, it's a bright nose. You'll get a nice, uh, nice aroma to it. Um, and then it like, as far as like what it hits on the palate, like it's, there's a little something in there for everyone. Like you get a little bit of tannin, you get a, a nice sharp acidity. There's a little bit of sweetness to balance it out. Um, but not too much. Um, yeah, that's kind of the short, that would be the short of what I, how I start and, um, it's clean and bright and crisp and, and very apple-y. I mean, I think you get like, it's totally apple-y. It's, it's just like a, yeah, it's a nice expression of all those apples. Like you're saying, like you, I think you put it very nicely of like you, this blend is like a really good expression of all things apple. And uh, yeah, it's just, it's a good introduction to a nice semi-dry cider. I am tasting this and I'm listening to, as you're explaining it and you're bringing these things in. Oh, yeah, yeah, I get that. All right, I get that. I get that. I'm also feel like I also connect with feelings of experiences, right? Either ones I've had or ones that I'd like to have. Yeah. It's August still. And I think the fall is not too far, you know, out in the distance, probably yeah. closer to where you are than where we are. But I almost mm -hmm. really feel like this is bringing this introduction to fall into my palate. And I'm also thinking, you know, like cider used to be the drink of the colonist. It used to be, you know, this is, you didn't drink the water. Everybody was drinking cider and you were drinking cider through the whole day. And, you know, we're just outside of Philadelphia. And mm -hmm. in my head, I'm picturing, you know, the Continental Congress getting together and they're all drinking cider and I'm watching this is in my head. I know it sounds crazy. Sure. But yeah, yeah, no, go on. Colonial times. These are the delegates walking through the cobblestone streets by Independence Hall. And this is the cider they're drinking. And you can see them in their overcoats and all those things. That's a great way to bring this cider into just the forefront of, of what you can experience with ciders. The flavor, what I enjoyed, you get the sweetness at first. You get a little bit of the viscosity. And it's immediately... Um, overtaken by a light effervescence, just really light. Once your palate gets used to the, the 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 sugar profile of the apples, and then I think the acidity takes over. There's a sourness to it. There's a, a, a tannic component to it. And I almost get, again, this is why I always go back to, and I never want to short the yeast or how everybody's, you know, doing that fermentation because I think the yeast does create some characteristics. And I am getting a little bit of that, that, that bread note, that yeasty note to the finish of this. It, it just kind of lingers. There's a dryness, but my mouth is still salivating and I want more. Yeah, um, great. Yeah, yeah. You've, you've got this wonderful bottle, this wonderful label, and you do it justice by the cider that goes in the bottle. So cheers Great. to you and Adam and Aaron and Peter and all the team at Milk and Honey Ciders. When people come to Taproom, I mean, paint the picture. Is it this long winding road full of apples and you get to a barn? What does it look like there? So we're just off of, uh, I actually have a quick, follow-up question from earlier about your colonists before I go on to that. Is that okay if I jump it's back? It's okay. You got you got um, the long overcoats and everything just from the taste of the cider? Yeah. Yeah. That's wonderful. I yeah. love that. Yeah, That's I great. mean, 
that's that's really look you can i think it was um i think it was a uh, cider con one of them and i went to a tasting and this is going back to the one in chicago a couple of years ago and we, we were doing a tasting and sometimes we were doing a tasting and one of the things that they uh expressed was what color do you see when you when you taste cider now sometimes that happens for me um but I think that's what you do when you slow down and you want to appreciate what you're enjoying, what you're experiencing. Let your mind be in that moment. For mm -hmm. me, it's colonists walking down the street. And for others, it could draw them back to another experience, which I think is why we enjoy these things. Right? Yeah, yeah for sure. That's wonderful. No, I just, uh, I yeah, I'm like, wow, all those, you know, the across the country sources for all those apples coming together made in Minnesota, but you're, you know, because you're drinking in uh, Southeast Pennsylvania, you're getting the colonial historical uh, perspective brought in with drinking the cider. That's wonderful. I just, I thought that was wonderful and humorous. So appreciate See, I think that. that. I think that we can share on that. Any look, it's, it's saying that I find when you see stuff like you talked about, like if you go to your beverage store or wherever you may get something and you see this plethora of ciders and bottles and how do you choose which one? How yeah. do you know which one to say, that's my drink tonight or that's what I'm bringing to a friend's house or I really want to try that other than, you know, again, that standout label at first and the color. I mean, you've got right. this beautiful alchemy when you talked about the pomo and that brandy, this has such a deep, rich yeah. color to it. It almost <laughs> looks more, I mean, th there's qualities, especially with the bottle. Um, my mind is saying there's going to be mead in here or right. something of a higher viscosity yep. than perhaps a cider. When you need to distinguish yourself, you know, obviously you have that. But right. what's most important, look, Pat, if I go to your cidery, I'm I'm meeting you. I'm meeting other people. I have this experience that now I have a connection, and I'm a I'm, I'm a fan. Yeah. And we've we've talked a lot about this. I mean, if if we see you know, and we get to meet you and or your team and and the the people that are responsible for this, if we meet you at CiderCon, immediately, oh yeah, we're friends. You know, we have a connection, and I'm also saying. If you ever see this in Pennsylvania on the shelves, if you've heard the podcast, or I'm sure people can order and it can be shipped yeah. to them, right? You can, yeah. On our website, there's a spot that says ship cider and you can order, order it right to your door. So that's no problem. I know it's 40, I'm pretty sure it's 40 states. Not everything can get shipped to Alaska, but everybody that's on Vino Shipper that participates in that, they can get the cider. So, um, and yeah, back to your question about um, painting the picture of where, uh, what's it like to drive up to the side or what, what is it, what's the landscape like? Um, Stearns County's kind of got some rolling hills um, and like there's a part of just further west of where the cidery is referred to as the Avon Hills. So you'll have kind of, you have a rolling prairie um, hardwood landscape that's, uh, you know, around you as well as like monoculture soybean and uh corn agriculture that's you know the land that's kind of the landscape and we're right next to i-94 which um you know we're we're more rural so you you're driving you know 70 miles an hour down the interstate either way for the most part and um you get off the interstate you take a left and immediate right and then we're not that far we're a half a mile down the road pretty much on county road 51 and it's just like there's a there's a big wooded grove as you're going west down the road that kind of hides the building and the orchards, but you can kind of see this like tall deer fence as you're coming up, and you there will be a sign that's like milk and honey ciders 300 feet, and then you almost like you can just about miss it, you know, as you're going up over the hill, but then you turn right and there's you know a wide gravel path and you have um, a sloping hill that has you know several rows of uh apple trees and we're we're doing the you know they're all along a trestle and they're relatively short between like six and eight feet tall for the most part 
and you got three structures that are on the property. The one immediately on your left is the cidery, which has a, a large patio with lots of picnic tables, probably like 20, 25 picnic tables. Um, you have the wooden exterior uh, of the cidery, which once you walk into the tap room is relatively small. You can seat maybe 30 to 40 people comfortably, but it's just like one large living room that's 30 by 30 feet square for the most part. Um, and, you know, we've got eight, 10 taps that are on the wall behind you. And the, the wall itself has um, broken up apple crates that we've ne then uh, created to make like an artistic rendition of like a stack of apple crates going up the wall. Um, you can look through a window in the tap room and you'll see the production room, which has, you know, five different very large stainless steel vessels. So that's for the production of the, of the cider. Um, so that's, that's primarily what you would experience or see from uh, for the first building. And then there's two other structures that are off on the right. And one of them is kind of a rotunda, um, which that's where we host a lot of live music um, in the summers. We have a music series. I don't remember. It's a dozen concerts maybe throughout the summer. And then there's a larger pavilion that um, we have trivia that, I mean, this, this pavilion is, I don't know how, I don't know how big it is, but it's like a, it's a mostly open structure with a large roof over it. And um, that can comfortably have like 300 folks in it. And we have, on Thursday nights through the summer uh, trivia night where like 300 folks would come out for trivia. Wow. Uh, it started off like early on when the tap room opened, tap room opened like 2017 or 18. Uh, it was like, there was a couple of folks that were like, can we do trivia here at your cidery? And I think that there, there was an attitude of like, you think that's going to work? Do you think people are going to come out for trivia? And it, it has worked rather well. Like that worked out excellently where that, got a lot of uh, momentum and people come out for Thursday nights primarily from the St. Cloud area to enjoy some cider and play some trivia. So thank you for painting that picture of yeah. my experience. Should I, I'll, I'll now know I'm like, there's our pad pointed out where they're trellising the apples and all the right. stuff like that. And uh, the, the, the milk crate wall and all the things he's doing. Look, this is, you get 300 people to show up for trivia. You've got mm -hmm. concert series. I can see why you and your wife said, this is like, this is the land of milk and honey. This is the abundance. Yeah. And uh, I'm just wondering when you guys had the wedding cake, did you have like an apple and you guys bite into apples kind of like no, the, uh, the garden actually, thing? <laughs> as you're saying, you know, that, Oh, I can imagine, you know, with these other, those other structures, the second two didn't exist when we had our wedding. So we, we mostly had our wedding out in the, um, that patio area, but um, no, our, our wedding cake, we did a, uh, we do cupcakes. We didn't do a big one. <laughs> <laughs> we, we didn't have apples. We both had coincidentally had red velvet uh, cakes at like our graduation party. It's like, yeah, we like red velvet. So let's do, so we did that. Yeah. All right. Not they owe you, they owe you a, uh, a, a rejuvenation of your vows in this new space or something. That, yeah, like absolutely. Yeah. The next anniversary party. That's right. <laughs> All right. So one of the things for me and what I enjoy about doing this podcast is I don't do any preliminary investigation. I don't do a lot of research. Um, I, I don't even really know what we're being sent. Yeah. Through these bottles. So I didn't know what the alchemy was until yeah. I brought it to my nose. And then I did a double take kind of like Scooby-Doo because we had talked about the ice cider and yep. I didn't even know you sent me an ice cider. A lot of people hoard that. They don't want to send that out. So thank you for that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I want to spread the good news. And like there's a like ice cider, like you were saying, it's it can be hard to make and it's rare. And it's uh, yeah, there's you have to have a specific climate in order to be able to produce it. And, you know, I'm happy to happy to share that. And I mean, I think for me, that's ice cider as I've learned about what it takes to make and what it is it's it's special and it's grown to be my favorite product at first i was like oh, i don't want to do something that sweet but it's it's different it's got its own it's its own category it's its own world 
what the balance is and why I had to do a little double take was because there's an higher there's a higher ABV presentation than I was expecting. In mm-hmm. in my mind, I thought perhaps this was just one of the cider other cider uh, varietals that you're producing, the expressions you're producing, and I get the alchemy part now. You know, I, I get the idea why it's labeled that way. And from the way you're you're kind of coring that apple, because the nose, once you get past that, um, I think I think there's something here for at least what I've experienced right now with milk and honey ciders is there's there's a presentation or there's a this is who we are. Representation of the apples, clean, bright, dry, as you talked about that no matter what you're going to get, everything across the board has that kind of profile. With this, I've had a number of different ice ciders, and Mm. this, it's not overly sweet. There Mm. are the sugars that are being pulled out, but I love the sour finish. I, I just love the finish of the skins of the apple that really linger that that pull out that tannin in in all this by far this is i can see why this is your favorite i'm gonna hoard this i'm gonna i'm gonna hide it from dawn and she'll never see this <laughs> yeah you're gonna love that one yeah good no that's good i mean yeah there there should be just you may get a little tannin um i think it's northern spy and wine sap apples which for the most part are sweet dessert apples um but we do barrel age it, uh, the alchemy for, um, I think it's like seven months. So, I mean, the, what it's drawing from the barrel might be some of that sour note or that like, um, like caramely kind of finish. I so think the, that's where you're getting the vanillins and, yeah. um, you're getting those, uh, brown sugar caramel notes. I, you know, again, I'm picturing this hot, steamy baked apple that just came out of the oven and this is what you stuck in the bottle. And this is what I get to drink in my glass. Yeah. Great. This is that baked apple that uh, only grandma knew the recipe and nobody else did. And only she could make it because everybody else screwed it up because whatever she did that, that old apple core that came from the 1800 or whatever. I don't know. Yeah. Cool. No, that's great. Yeah. That's fun. No, it's, <laughs> it's fun. I, I like the name of it too. I mean, alchemy, something that's spun into gold. You know, that that idea or that concept is, uh, yeah, it's intriguing. It's kind of mysti- mystifying in some ways of like, how did that happen? Or, you know, eyes will light up. People's eyes will widen when they taste it. And they're like, I did, I have no idea what this was and didn't have any expectation. And they'll be like, wow, that's incredible. Um, that's that's a fun thing to to share with folks. Um, so you, so you, you, you like send these, you these two these two wonderful expressions, and what are some of the other expressions people can uh, look forward to? Either a when they're on the website looking to ship or going right to the tap room. Sure. Um, as far as things, if you're looking to ship uh, our ciders, the Little Dipper um, is a semi-dry. We have a blend of fresh juice in it, so that one's juicy it's sweeter it's more of like a session style of a cider as far as an expression um our seasonal ciders are often pretty popular right now it's a tart cherry which is an ash meets kernel northern spy uh blend of apple base and then we blend montmorency cherries into the cider so it's it's like a cherry that's a little more like dark and rich and um, like just get it, that to me, I get like the, the baked cherry pie kind of a, a note, like what you're saying about like apple pie with the ice cider. I think that there's kind of like a cherry pie uh, note or element to, to the tart cherry. We do, we make a, the fall is wonderful. Um, we make a chaga chai cider. Are you familiar at all with chaga, Rich? Isn't it a, 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 a chaga? Isn't like a, a a main or a root or something? Yeah, it, chaga is a mushroom. Mushroom. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, yeah. I, I knew. Yeah, it. I, so I pictured mushroom. it in my head. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So chaga is a mushroom. Um, chai, of course, is tea, and we have a lot of like earthy root um, spices that are in 
was, you know, infused into the cider. Um, and that one, that one's pretty popular. And I mean, it's unique to have a botanical, almost umami character to a cider um, with the, the chaga coming through in that. Um, so that one's more of a release in the fall. You'll see that one in late September, early October. Um, we have a golden rust single varietal, which is very much like an apple wine. Like it, it's a still dry cider. Um, we ferment that one totally dry. And um, other things that we make in the tap room, we make an estate blend. Like I think I mentioned earlier, we have eight acres of our own orchards. Um, and so we make, uh, you know, a, an estate where it's just the, the yeasts that are on the apples are the ones that are doing the fermentation. Um, it's kind of an expression of, uh, of place as best as we can. We've made an orchard blend where we, we pitch a yeast and uh, same idea, we have, you know, apples from our orchards that we're adding a yeast and then that comes out to, uh, you know, a, a cider that has a, a unique expression in that way too. Um, and those are both generally only available at the tap room. So it's worth a trip. I mean, I, maybe some of your listeners are more on the East Coast and it's like, when am I going to go to central Minnesota for a trip? But, you know, if that occasion ever arises, it can be, it's, it can be worth it to get out of town a little bit and, and come enjoy some good cider. Well, Minnesota should be very proud of having you just sharing the abundance of what you're doing with the world. All those varietals, everything that you mentioned, I'm like, yeah, I want that one and I want that one. And I, they become more exciting as you list them. And, uh, you know, there, there's, you know, as long as the, we're one of the 40 states, uh, we'll benefit from those because they sound amazing and delicious. Pat, this has been a treat. Your ciders are so wonderful. And uh, thank you for sharing these. Thanks for sharing them with our listeners. Is there anything we haven't talked about today on the podcast? Anything you want listeners to know more about you um, or Milk and Honey Ciders? I'm grateful for the opportunity to talk about it, Rich. Uh, first podcast. I'm I'm grateful to you know do it with you. And I'm glad that you like the expressions. I don't think I have anything else I'd really need to toot my own horn about or um, milk and honey. Yeah. I mean, it's been a good company to work for and I've really enjoyed learning a lot about the cider industry and um, cider people are so cool. People who are into cider, it, it's a great, like cider con 2020, when did I go? 2023 with Chicago, the last one that was, you know, it's just fun to meet people who are enthusiastic about um, a unique and great beverage. And, um, yeah, there's just so many different expressions of what cider is and can be. And, um, yeah, thanks Rich for the questions and this opportunity was great. So I would say for the listener, if you know, our show, we love ciders. And if you want to try these, definitely go to the website, get them shipped out and give some feedback. Let everybody else know what you experienced. Share these with friends and help the cider community grow because the more people create that level of higher expectation, the more quality ciders like yours come out. Thank you so much for being a friend of Fermented Adventure. Hopefully we'll see you at CiderCon 2025 in Chicago and get a chance to raise a glass together. Enjoy the fall. Enjoy all that you're doing. And um, thank you again so much for your time today. Likewise, Rich. Appreciate it. Take care. Cheers. Cheers.